Hi, my name is Paul Grogan, and in this Gaming Rules video, I'm going to be teaching you how to play Through the Ages, A New Story of Civilization. Now, this video is going to be a little bit different from all of my other videos, in that I'm recording it with no script, and I'm not going to do any digital effects. And the reason for that is that there is an urgency to get this video out as soon as possible. So, yes, I've only just got back from Essen, which is why my voice is still not quite there. And I'm just going to try and record this video uh, quickly and get it out there to help everybody learn how to play. Through the Ages is a civilization style game. It takes two to four players and it can take a number of hours to play. It's moderately complex, there's a lot of rules in there, but the gameplay, once you know the game, is fairly streamlined and elegant. So hopefully this video will get you started in playing the game. Now I've got this game set up for two players and what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be going through a, num a few turns of the game in order to give you an idea of, of how it plays but also, I am not going to be teaching you all of the rules up front. I'm going to be getting started as soon as possible, and then I'll be explaining more rules as we go. This is the process that I use when I'm demoing this game, and I've spent four days at Essen pretty much demoing this game to lots and lots of people. So, let's jump into the game. First of all, I'm going to show you the player board. Now, each player has one of these. This is the one for the green player, and there's lots of information all over the board. I'm not going to explain all of it immediately, but bit by bit as we go along. Your empire starts off quite small, and it consists of these seven yellow cubes, which are your workers. Now, each one of these represents a number of people doing a specific job. This one over here represents a group of warriors that are providing you with one point of military strength. If you build more warriors during the game, you'll gain more strength. These two cubes here represent farmers who will generate food for you at the end of each of your turns. These two are miners, and they'll generate resources for you at the end of each of your turns. This one here is a scientist, let's call him Derek. He's locked away in his laboratory doing crazy research and he's going to provide for you one point of science at the end of your turn. Now this here, it's important to know the difference between the cubes and the cards. This card here is a temple, which you can see by this icon here, and it's religion, which is the first form of temples. Now this card here doesn't mean that you actually have any of them. It represents that you know how to build them, but you don't actually have any at the moment. So again, if you look at this card, this uh, philosophy, this is a laboratory. The card itself means that you know how to build them and the presence of the cube on there means that you actually have one of them. So you don't start the game with any temples, but you can build them during the game. Finally, you have one spare worker, which is here in your worker pool. Uh, these people are sat at home with nothing to do, reading the newspaper and waiting to be given some work. The yellow cubes down here are not your workers at the moment. They are potential future population. So if you imagine that there was a map to this game and in that map, on that map you have a small empire at the start, that empire consists of these guys, okay? Now as you expand your empire during the game, you will move these yellow cubes one by one from here to here. That represents that they are now unused workers and you can put them to work on one of the cards. And as the game goes on, you will be getting more and more workers from here. Uh, the blue cubes I'm going to explain in a moment. And the white and the red cubes are how many actions you get for that turn. The number of cubes here are determined by your government type. So you start off as despotism, which gives you four civil actions and two military actions every round. It's an action point allowance game. You can't just simply do everything that you want to do on your turn. Everything that you do costs you either a civil action or a military action. So these determine how many actions you get for that round. So I've got everything set up for a two player game, green and red, and I've randomly decided at the start of the game that green is the start player. What we do is we take one of these A cards and we just took it under the edge here. That's never gonna change so that all players will get the same number of turns during the game. We mark that the green player is going first because they've only got one civil action to do, and the red player will have two civil actions. The first round is, is a very special round, it's very simple, and you've got very limited choices of what you actually do. So first thing we do is we take the antiquity cards, this, so these are the age A civil cards, we give them a shuffle and then we deal the cards out onto the card row here. Okay, so you'll notice that there's lots of different types of cards. The green ones are leaders, the purple ones are wonders, and the yellow ones are action cards. And all the cards work in a slightly different way. So on the first player's turn, so green, gets one civil action and there's only actually one thing that he's allowed to do which is to take a card from the card row. Now 
these circles here indicate the number of actions that it costs to take the card from the card row. So he's only got one civil action, which means he can only take one of these five cards. So let's say, for example, he decides to take the Colossus, because who doesn't like a big man with a spear and a torch? Now, this is a wonder card, and wonder cards are special because they don't go into your hand. They're the only type of card that don't go into your hand when you take them. What happens is you just put them here, and that means that the wonder is under construction. You've drawn on a piece of paper a stick man, and you've decided we're going to build that. So it isn't built yet, it's going to be built later on in the game. And that's the end of the green player's first turn. He spent his one civil action, and he's taken that card. So what we then do is we do production. Now production happens at the end of each player's turn, and the first thing that you do in production is you score science and culture. So what we do is we look at the science and culture tracks. So up here we have the science track, and this is the culture track. Science is something that you're going to need during the game in order to develop new technologies, but culture is actually the victory points. Culture is what wins you the game. Now you've got a number of markers on here, so we've got the green markers for the green player, and what we have is this is how much science the green player currently has, which is zero. This is how much science they're actually generating every round. Now this should start off on one because we have the scientist. The scientist, just, the scientist is generating one point of science every turn. On the culture track we have zero culture and we're currently not generating any culture because we have nothing in play which gives us any culture. So at the end of the green player's turn he's generating one science which means he gains one science point. The next thing that happens is corruption, but I'll explain that later on. And then we go on to food production. So remember what I said earlier on, these yellow cubes, these are farmers, they're going to generate food. Now, the way that it works is it's really simple. Each yellow cube on one of the farm cards produces one blue cube. So we've got this yellow cube here produces this one. You always take from right to left. So that goes there. And this one produces this one. So you've got two yellow cubes, which means you get two blue cubes. Now, these blue cubes on this card represent one food. So you currently have two food. Uh, in a similar way, we've got resource production. So again, on here, every yellow cube produces a blue cube. So we move one blue cube there and another blue cube here. And on this card, the blue cubes represent resources. Now, you only use the blue cubes on these brown cards. So on here, they represent food, and on here, they represent resources. So what we've got is we've now got two food and we've got two resources and that's the end of the production stage. So we now go to the red player's turn. Now red, because he was going second, has two civil actions. So he could take one of these cards here or any two of these cards. So let's say, for example, he decides to take Aristotle. Now, Aristotle is a leader, which is a green card. These cards go into your hand when you take them. So it costs you a number of civil actions to take the card. So we're just going to put that on there to show we've spent that action and then we take Aristotle into our hand. The second card that Red wants to take is Cultural Heritage. So he's going to spend his other civil action, take that card into his hand, and then Red is going to do production, which is the same as green. We get two blue cubes on there and two blue cubes on there. And that is pretty much the end of the first round. Red also scores one science point, which you can't see here as it's off camera. So both players get all of their actions back, and we go into round two. Now, in round two of the game, what happens from now on at the start of each player's turn is that we're going to move all of the cards in the card row down. But if you notice on here, we have four, three, and two. This means that at the start of each turn, a number of cards that are in these positions will disappear out of the game. So in a four-player game, you will lose the card that is in this position, if there is one there, in a three-player game, you'll lose these two cards, and in a two-player game, you will lose all of these three cards. So this is a two-player game, so what we do is we get rid of Alexander the Great and Urban Growth. They're gone, they're out of the game, and then everything else slides down. So cards which were more expensive uh, now become cheaper. Uh, the next thing we do is we refill the card row with cards from the, uh, the Age of Antiquity civil deck. Okay, now... There is a special rule about this game for age A. What you do is you refill the card row at the end of the starting player's second turn, but any excess cards, if we have any cards left from the age A deck, they're removed from the game as well. Now this is an exception. Normally all of the other three ages you go through every single card that's in there, but for age A you fill it on the first player's turn 
and then after that, they're gone. This is also the end of age A, and the game now moves into age one. So now that we've done the card row, it's now the green player's turn. And what they've now got is they've got all of these actions to spend, and they can do lots of different things. So they've got four civil actions and two military actions. Now what the green player wants to do is he wants to build this Colossus as soon as he can, because he's got it there, and the earlier he builds it, the, the more benefit he'll get from it. But to build the Colossus, it's built in two stages. So the first stage will cost three resources, and he doesn't actually have three resources. So he's thinking, oh right, well I'm going to have to do something to get, get more resources. So what he decides to do as, uh, as one action, so you spend one civil action, and we're going to just put it on here to show that this is what he's doing. He's going to build a new mine. Now he can do that because if you look here, the cost to build a new mine is two resources. Uh, same as the cost to build a farm. Uh, but a philosophy lab and a religion temple, they cost three, so he can't, he can't build those. So yes, so he decides that he's going to build a new mine, spends the civil action, spends the two resources that's shown here. So what we do is we take these two, remember these are resources, and we put them back down here. And then he moves this unused worker, who's currently sat at home doing nothing, up here. So we now have a third mine. Now, there's no limit to how many cubes you have on farms, mines, or military units. There is a limit to how many cubes you have on these gray cards, which are known as urban buildings. And I'll come on to that later on. So we've spent one action and we've built a mine. The next thing we're gonna do is, it's, it's often a good idea to keep a spare worker in the worker pool. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna explain how you get more workers. Now, this is done by spending a civil action again. And what you do is you move one of the cubes from your yellow bank up to your worker pool. And this costs a number of food as can be shown on the bottom here. So it starts off costing two, which is handy because we have two food. So we spend one civil action and we spend two food, which goes back down there. And we move this guy up to here. We now have a spare worker and we've spent two of our actions. So what are we gonna do next? So we, we're out of resources, so we can't build anything else. We're out of food, so we can't grow our population. Uh, we've no cards in hand, because playing cards in hand is, is something that we could do. So let's have a look at the card row. Now, what we could have done, if we were thinking about it, is we could have actually taken Moses before we started doing all of that, and then we could have played Moses, which would have actually meant that we could have increased our population cheaper. But let's say we decided not to do that. Let's say we really wanted um, Hammer Rabbi as a leader. For some reason, we really like him. Maybe it's the beard and his hat. But yeah, we've decided we're going we're gonna to take him. Now, this cost two civil actions to take. So we spend our two civil actions and we take this card into our hand. There we go. Now, so one of the skills in this game is knowing when to spend more actions to take the card that you really want. If you're constantly waiting for the cards to get cheaper, then you might miss out, especially with more players in the game, because the cards are going down the row and other people are gonna be grabbing the cards as well. So yes, it's a definite skill in the game to know when to spend extra actions and take the cards. So that's the end of our turn. We're not actually able to spend these military actions, but that's okay. Uh, so what we now do is we do scoring, science and culture. Has it changed? No, we've still got this guy here doing research, so we gain one point of science. Uh, so we, we've got two yellow cubes here, so we gain two blue cubes, so we've now got two food again. But this time we've got three yellow cubes here, so we actually gain three blue cubes. So we now have three resources, which means we can start building our Colossus next turn, if we want to, depending on what else we want to do. So that's the end of Green's turn. Now. These military actions I mentioned, if you don't use them, that's, that's okay, because at the end of your turn, for each red cube that you haven't spent, you get to draw one military card. Now, what I forgot to do was, because Age A was over at the end of Green's turn, I should have moved the Age 1 civil deck and military decks onto this board here. So, the Green player has two red cubes left at the end of their turn, which means they get to draw two military cards from the deck, okay? Now I'll explain them in a minute, but they go into his hand. It's really important, I think, that when you are taking these military cards, you always do it at the very, very end of your turn. So after you've done your production and after you've moved these cubes around, because otherwise what tends to happen is that you'll draw the cards, you'll get distracted by the pretty pictures and all of the words, 
and you'll forget to do your production. I've been playing the game for nine years and I still see it done now. So if you get into the habit of following this sequence, do your uh, science and culture, then do all of your cubes here, and then at the very end, draw your military cards. So that's the end of the green player's turn and we go over to the red player. So again, we do the card row. So these three cards disappear, poor Moses. And then we shuffle the cards down. Oh, let's give, uh, let's give Green his actions back ready for next turn. Right, so we shuffle the cards down and now we're drawing cards from the age one deck. So these have been shuffled. We have taken out nine of the cards because it's a two player game and the rules will tell you which cards you need to remove. So let's just have some cards on here. There we go. Right, so now it's Red's turn. So again, Red has four civil actions and two military actions. Now, what he wants to do is he's got these two cards that he picked up last round. Now, it costs an action to play cards. Um, it costs an action to play the yellow cards, which basically do what they say on them, and they're then discarded. To play a leader costs you one action, and that leader stays with you until he dies, which won't be until quite some time. These leaders are really good. They, last, they, they live for a long time, and they have a, a, a positive effect on the game for you. So, based on the board and everything else, uh, I think what the red player is going to do is, he's going to play Aristotle, okay? So putting the leader into play costs one civil action. Uh, and Aristotle says, every time you take a technology card from the card row, you score one science. Now a technology card is anything which has a light bulb symbol on. Now there were none of them in AJ, but lots of cards in age one and all of the other ages will have a light bulb symbol on. So they're technology cards. Okay, so, but we probably don't want to spend these actions at the moment because we've got lots of choices here and there's lots of other things we want to do on our turn. So I think what we're going to do, ah, now the pyramids is actually a really good wonder. So I think we're going to take that. So we'll spend one civil action to take the pyramids. That goes directly into play here. So again, we haven't, we haven't built it yet. It's got to be built in stages. And then I think we'll follow the same uh, pattern as what the green player did. So we'll spend one action to increase our population, which moves that from there to there, costing two food. And then we'll spend the other action to build a new mine. So that costs two resources. And we put this one on here. Um, and that's our turn over. So this card that we took in our hand last turn, we're going to keep that in our hand. We can play that later in the game. So that's the end of the red player's turn. And let's do production. So we gain one science, we're still not generating any culture, we gain two food, and we gain three resources. Okay. Uh, and we also, because again, we've got two of these military actions left, we draw two military cards as well. Uh, let's, take our, let's take our actions back. Uh, where's the other one? There we go. And that's the end of the red player's turn two. So we're now in the start of round three of the game with Green about to take his third turn. Now round three and onwards is where you actually start following the full sequence of play. The reason we haven't done it in rounds one and two is because there are certain things that are requirements for that to happen and they've, they've not come up yet. So at the start of uh, Green's third turn, we'll do the card row as we do every turn. So that's them gone. Slide everything down. And let's see what juicy cards we get from the age one deck. So I've got some Knigets, uh, Cartography and Swordsman. Right, okay. So the next thing that happens is that Green will get to do a politics phase. Now, as I say, we didn't mention this in round two because to do a politics phase, you need to have these military cards. And we didn't have these at the start of round two, but now we do. So let's just have a look at what Green's got. Okay, so we've got two cards here. Now these are secret. So the other players won't have actually seen what uh, Green has picked up. But this one here is an event card. And you can see from the crown in the top left corner, that means it's played as your political uh, action for the turn. What you do is you, you prepare an event. So we're just gonna put that card there for now. And let's say, for example, that the Green player is gonna decide to play this card. So yeah, this is an event card and it's time to explain how the event area works. So this is the event area of the game, and it's divided into three sections. Uh, first of all, this section is the future events. These are things that are gonna happen at some point later on in the game. These are the current events, which are gonna be happening sort of soonish, and these are past events, things that have happened in the past. 
At the start of the game, we will take a number of Age A military cards, two more than the number of players randomly from the deck, and we'll give them a shuffle and we'll put them down there. Now, Green has decided that he's going to play this event card, so what we do is we place it onto the future events pile. Now, the first thing that happens is whenever you place a card on here, you score culture points equal to the number on the back. So Green now has one point and he's winning the game. Hooray! The next thing that happens is that we draw this card, reveal it, and it has an effect on all players. So there's four cards in this deck. Once four cards have been played here, all of these cards will have been revealed. What then happens is we take these cards, shuffle them, and build a new current event deck. So what you're doing is by placing a card here, you're deciding on an event which is going to happen at some point later on in the game, and obviously you will then adjust, adjust your strategy according to what card you've played on here. So if this card gives a bonus for the strongest player, then when it comes out, you will probably want to be the strongest player. Whereas all of these cards in AJ, these are all good for all players. So let's have a look at the first card that we've drawn. So the event card that's been revealed is Development of Crafts, which means each civilization gains two resources. So we mark that by moving two blue cubes onto this bronze card. Remember, each of these blue cubes represents one resource. So we've produced two resources, so we get two blue cubes. And the same for the red player. So let's do that there. Right, so that's the political phase over. You only get one political action. So now it's Green's main action phase, and he gets to spend all of these cubes that he's got here. So again, we've got four civil actions and two military actions. So just having a look at the board and what cards we've drawn, the other military card we've got in our hand is this. Now, this is a tactics card. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to play this just so I can show you what happens. So what? So, so the, the tactics card costs one military action to play. So we spend one of our military actions and we put the tactics card into play. Now, a tactics card basically means that if you have this combination of military units, you get this strength bonus, okay? So we should only have one strength at the moment because we've got one warrior. So we can play the tactics card even though we don't actually meet this requirement yet, okay? We've decided that if we join two guys together, we will get an extra point of strength. We don't have two guys yet, so let, let's build one. So the cost to build a warrior is two resources, but you notice that the number is in a red circle. That means it costs a military action to build a warrior. So we spend a military action, and we spend two resources by putting them down here, like so. And then what we do is we move this unused worker up here. So normally, that would give us an extra one point of strength, because this guy's given us one point, and this guy's given us the other point. But because we've got the fighting band, and we now, we now have this, we have two infantrymen, because this military unit is an infantry, we have two infantry, so we get an extra strength. So our strength actually goes to three, which is quite a nice advantage at this stage in the game. So we've now got four civil actions still, and let's decide that we're going to start building the Colossus. So to build a stage of a wonder costs one civil action, and uh, this one costs three resources. We have three resources, which is good. So what we do is we spend these three, but we take one of them and we put it there over the first number to show that we've built one stage. And the other two go back to our bank here. Right, we've still got three civil actions left. Based on the cards that I can see on the card row, I think what we're going to do, we're going to increase our population again. So let's spend one civil action and two food. Let's spend this food here. Okay. And we move this guy up here. So we've got a spare worker. It's normally good to keep a spare worker until these cards have run out. Uh, I might explain why later on or I might not. Now, we've got no resources left, uh, so we can't do any of that. We can't build anything else, but what we can do is we can take some cards from the card row. Now, we're looking at Julius Caesar and thinking, oh, Julius Caesar could be quite nice because we've got three strength. This would give us an extra strength and a red cube, so it would give us an extra military action. However, we took Hammurabi in hand, and the rules of the game are that you're not allowed to have two leaders from the same age. Not, even if, the, even if the, he's not in play. We took him into our hand, which means we're not allowed to take another leader from AJ. So we can't take Julius Caesar. Now we could play Hammer Rabbi, but his ability is that on our turn, we can use one of our military actions as a civil action. Now we've used both of our military actions, so there's no actual benefit to playing him this turn, but we probably want to play him at some point in future. 
Now, I think we should take this card, Engineering Genius. That is going to help us build the Colossus next turn. So let's spend an action to take that card. That goes into our hand. And let's have a look at what's left. Okay, no, I, I, think, I think rather than take any more cards, we're going to play Hammer Rabbi. So it costs us an action to play Hammer Rabbi. And that's it. We've actually used all of our actions this turn. So we don't get to draw any more military cards. This is one of the balancing things in the game. If you are spending your military actions in doing military stuff, then you will get less military cards on the next round. The other thing to explain at this stage is that there is actually a hand limit. Now, the hand limit for civil cards is the number of civil actions that you've got. So we have four civil actions. Where's the other one gone? There we go. So we've got four civil actions, which means we've got a hand limit of four civil cards, which are the, the yellow backed ones. And there is a tendency when you first play the game to go, oh, that card's cool, I'll grab that. Oh, I'll grab that. Oh, I'll grab that. But remember, every card costs an action to play, and some of the other cards will cost science to play as well. So you, you want to try and avoid taking too many cards into your hand, because you probably won't be able to play them all. So Green has finished his turn, and we're about to start the production phase. But before we do that, I'm going to explain about uprisings and happiness marker which is possibly one of the most complex parts of the game. So if you get this, you should be fine. Basically, the yellow bank is divided into sections, okay? And each section has to have something in it, otherwise you have an uprising. Now, an uprising is really bad, because if you have an uprising, you actually skip your production phase, which means no culture, no science, no food, and no resources. Now, at the moment, we don't have anything in this section, which means we're going to have an uprising. And there are two ways to prevent the uprising. First of all, the happiness marker. If the happiness marker was here, then we're okay, because we've got something in this section. The other way of doing it is if you have any spare workers, you can just put them temporarily on this space here, and that counts as having something in that section. Now, this is a discontent worker, okay? It's still an unused worker, so you can still use it for building things. But if you don't use it to build something that gives you a happy face, so, for example, if you decide to build a warrior with it, then you've got an uprising, okay? If, however, you were to build a temple with it, the temple would give you one happy face, that moves to there, and you're okay. So, um, that's how it works. I'm just going to continue another example, assuming we were playing later into the game. This next section has got four cubes in it, okay? So, let's say that one was there, and you've managed to avoid the uprising. Uh, remember, this, the section has to be empty for you to have an uprising. So, in other words, you, you could move that to there and you're fine. You could move that to there and you're okay. You could move that to there and you're okay. You could even use these three to build three more warriors if you wanted to. And you're still okay because there's something in this section. But as soon as this guy moves out of that section, there, it's empty. Which means you've got an uprising, okay? But again, you've got a spare one here, so you could put that there. So you could actually theoretically play the game with zero happiness as long as you've got plenty of these workers here, you know, to put over the spots. But of course that's tying up these workers when they could be used for something else. Let's say this was the situation and we were to do something during the game that then gained us two happy faces. What would happen is this would move along to here and these guys would suddenly become happy, unused workers. They're not discontent anymore and they're happy to go back to work. So, putting us back where we were, let's just reset this, and we were there. So that's how it is at the end of Green's turn, and what we do is we put this marker on here so that we avoid the uprising. Since we've avoided an uprising, we do production. So the first thing we do is score science and culture. Again, we're not generating any culture, so we don't get any of that, uh, but we are still generating one science a turn, so we go up to three science. Okay. Next thing to do is food production. Again, we've got two yellow cubes, so we produce two blue cubes. But now I'm going to tell you about food consumption. Uh, if we look down here, you will see that this square here, which used to have a yellow cube on it, no longer has a yellow cube. And it now says minus one food. What this means is that your empire is now so big that you need to actually feed the excess people. They can't just live off the land anymore. So very simply, you consume one food. So we produce two but now we consume one, okay? Next thing to do is resource production. So we've got three of them, and then uh, draw military cards, but we, don't, we didn't have any military actions left. We'd use them all. We used one to build a warrior, one to build a fighting bank, so we had no military actions left. That means we don't get any extra military cards. 
And that's one of the balancing things in the game. If you actually spend your military actions on, on doing things, you will get less military cards. So that's the end of the green player's turn. We now do red's turn, and it's red's turn three. So again, we'll get rid of the card row, slide everything down, and then let's see what cards we get here. Okay, so we've got another wonder, we've got another action card, and another action card. Right, let's just have a look at what military cards the red player's got. We've got these two. Now this is an event card. It's a territory, uh, which is an event card, because the top looks the same as the other event card. Um, it's resolved in a slightly different way, but it is placed into there. And this is a defense card if, if anybody plays an aggression against us. So what we're going to do is we're going to play the event card. Now, if this was a proper game, we might not play this event card. The reason is, the green player is building the Colossus, and the Colossus gives a bonus to colonization when it's finished. And this is a territory, and when a territory comes up, you bid against the other players for who gets to colonize the territory. So yes, in, it could be that we play this territory and by the time it actually comes out, the green player is going to have an advantage. So it is a, a tricky decision to make, but we're going to play it anyway. So it goes into the future event pile. Again, the other player doesn't see this. This is a secret card. So it goes in there and red will score one culture. We then reveal the top card of the current event deck, which is development of religion. So what happens is... Uh, both players, each player with an unused worker, may immediately build an Age A temple for free. So, both players have an unused worker. Now, it's usually the case that you do want to use it, because getting a free temple is quite good. It saves you one action, and it saves you three resources. But there are certain situations when you may not want to use it. So, let's say, for example, the red player does want to build a temple. So, we move that to there. Now, this temple does two things. It generates one culture per turn. So what we do is we move the culture production marker to there and it produces one happy face. Now this is not one happy face per turn, this is just one happy face. And this here, this happiness marker, represents how much happy faces you've got. So we move that to the one. So green is also going to build a temple and this is the example we were showing earlier. This is a discontent worker and by build, remember he still counts as an unused worker so we can use him to build that temple for free which gives us the one happy face which means we avoid an uprising. Now, the uprising is only checked for at the start of a player's production phase. So in fact, if that was the situation going into Green's turn, Green can actually play his whole turn as normal, but it's only at the end of the turn when you check for uprising. But as it is, he's okay, so we'll be fine on his turn. So that's the event resolved. That's Red's politics phase done. So now it's Red's turn to take his turn. But before we do that, I'm going to explain about corruption, which again, I possibly should have explained on Green's turn, but I knew Green was going to prevent it. So I'm going to explain it here. Now you see this minus two in this square. Uh, this means that the red player is currently stockpiling resources. And if he does that, he's going to be faced with corruption. Now, you see at the start of your turn whether you're going to be corrupted or not, but the corruption doesn't actually happen until the start of your production phase. So at the start of your production phase, before you generate new cubes, if this symbol is visible, you will lose two resources, okay? If you don't have resources, you lose food. So if you had only one resource, you'd lose one resource and one food. Now, corruption isn't the end of the world. It's bad. You want to try to avoid it if you can, but it won't completely ruin your game. And the way you avoid it is really simple. As long as that space is covered over by the time it's your production phase, then you're okay. So you see clearly at the start of your turn whether you're going to be corrupted or not, and you know exactly what you need to do to avoid it is to spend two blue cubes. So Red's now going to take his turn, bearing in mind that uh, he does want to spend at least two blue cubes, which is which he's probably going to want to do anyway. So he's got four civil actions and two military actions. Green is ahead on military, so Green is on three military strength, and, and Red is only on one. But we know that the green player doesn't have any military cards in hand because he played both of the ones that he had last turn, and he didn't draw any more. So we're not in danger currently of, of being attacked. So we do want to try and get a bit closer in terms of military strength, but we don't need to do it this turn. So we've got lots of choices. We've got cards on here that we want to take. We've got the pyramids. We won't be able to finish the pyramids this round, because they're built in three stages, uh, needing a total of six resources, and we only have five resources this round. Let's just remind ourselves of what card we took, cultural heritage, so that's not going to help us build the wonder. Um, so I think the first thing we're going to do is we're, we're going to play cultural heritage. So very simple, play the card which costs one action, we score one science and four culture. 
So the red player gains one science, up to three, and four culture, so up to five. Take that, green player. Right, so that's one action spent. The next thing to do, I think, is we want to try and get more science. And Aristotle, every time you take a technology from the card row, you score one. So, ah, Irrigation and Alchemy. Now, these are really good cards to start with, I think. And these are technology cards, because they've got a light bulb, and they only cost one civil action to take. I think we're going to go into science as early as we can. So, what we're going to do is we're going to spend one action to take Alchemy. Okay, now this is a technology card, so we gain one science, so we're at four. Uh, that goes into our hand, but then what we want to do is we're going to spend one civil action to play the card. Now remember, the yellow cards are the only ones you can't play on the turn that you pick them up. All the other cards you can. So we're going to play this one. Now, playing it costs four science and an action. We have four science, so we spend all of our science to play the card. Now, where does it go? Well, this symbol here means it's a lab which is the same type as this. So actually, this is an upgraded version of our existing card, and what we do is we place it there. This guy here is still an old scientist. He's, he's still a philosopher, okay? So what we'd need to do, although we've played the card, we don't actually have any alchemy labs yet. We're gonna have to upgrade, and you can upgrade by spending one civil action, which is what we're gonna do, and the difference in cost between the two. So this costs three, this costs six. So if we pay three resources, one, two, three, okay, we can then move this scientist from here to here. He's now generating two science a turn instead of one. So we move this marker onto the two. And a quick tip, when you're playing the game, you want science production early on. You can't really do much. If your science production is only one for, for the game, you're going to be picking up these cards, but you're not going to be able to play them. So you want to be increasing your science output early on in the game. So we've done that. We've spent our four civil actions. Now, what are we going to do with our military actions? We, we could build a warrior, but we can't because we've, we've no workers here. Um, now, if you're in, in desperate times, you are able to disband your, your buildings or your units. But it costs the same action that it would have cost to build them. So if I decided, oh, I don't want this mine anymore, I can disband it or I can get rid of it but it would cost a civil action. You don't get any of the resources back. So I've no civil actions left. I can't actually get rid of them. Not that I would want to do in this stage. So uh, yeah, I don't really think there's anything I can do with these military actions based on the card I've got in hand. So I think that's probably Red's turn done. He hasn't built a stage of the pyramid, but he's probably gonna look at uh, at least starting it next turn. So we do Red's uh, culture and science. So we're producing two science now, so we go back up to two, and we are now producing one culture a turn uh, because we built the temple. Ah, green's, temp green's culture should be, uh, should be one as well. And then we get two cards because we've got two unused military actions. Okay, so that's the end of Red's turn. So we'll collect our actions back. And we'll do our card row. So these three go, and everything shuffles down. Right, we're whizzing through age one. Genghis Khan, monarchy, and theology. Right, so now it's Green's turn. So um, there's another thing that now happens after you've done the card row, is if you have a tactic card in front of you, at the start of your round, just after you've done the card row, then it's moved to here, and you place your little token on it. So you've not lost it, it's, it's still yours, but other people can now adopt that tactic by spending two military actions. Now this is one of the changes from the previous version, where a tactic was, was only ever yours for the whole game. So now, uh, if, if the red player wanted to on his turn, he could spend two military actions, and he could place his banner token on the card as well, okay? So effectively, when you play it, it's yours exclusively for one round, and then it, it goes here at the start of your next round. Okay, so now it's the politics phase. Now, Green doesn't, can't, he can't do a political action, because remember, he doesn't have any military cards. So we skip the politics phase for, for Green, and what's he gonna do? He's now got all of these actions that he wants to use. So I think we've got this Engineering Genius card. I think it's time we play it. So we play it, we spend one action, and then we do what the card says. Build a stage of a wonder, paying two less. 
Now you don't have to pay another, another civil action for building a stage of the wonder because the card itself tells you to do that. So you just pay the one action it costs to play this card and then within the effect of this card you build a stage of the wonder. So building the second stage of the Colossus normally costs three, with this it costs one. So we take the one, we put it on there. But now the Colossus is complete. So these resources go back here and the Colossus moves up to here. Okay, the Colossus is now complete and it has this effect on us for the rest of the game. So we gain two points of strength so we're up to five, so the red player is probably getting really worried now. And we get one point of colonization bonus whenever we are bidding for a territory, which isn't going to happen yet, but it probably will happen later on in the game. Right, now we've still got three of these left, uh, three civil actions, and we've still got two of these. We've got three science, so we could go for irrigation, and I think that's what we're going to do. So we use one civil action to take irrigation. So we take that card and we put it on our hand but we're then gonna spend one civil action to play it. And similar to the alchemy, because it's got the same symbol as that, it actually goes here. Now, this is where it gets clever. I think this is the coolest part of the game in the way that these resources work. These farmers here are still agriculture farmers, and this blue cube here is still representing one food. We haven't suddenly gained any additional food just by developing irrigation. But like we upgraded alchemy, we can now spend one action and the difference in resources, so between two and four, so we pay two resources, okay, and we now upgrade this guy, who I think is called Terry, and we upgrade him, he's now using irrigation. So we've got one guy still using agriculture, and one guy using irrigation, okay? We're not gonna do anything with our military actions, although we could use Hammer Rabbi. So let's just have a think. What we're gonna do is we're gonna think, oh, that cost, sorry, that cost three science to play irrigation. So we have no science, and we're only generating one science a turn, which is a bit of a problem. So I'm gonna not take any of these cards. So I think that's the end of the turn. We're not gonna use any of our military actions so that we get to draw a couple of cards. So we now do production phase. Um, so score, culture, and science. So we're gaining one culture because of the temple, and we're gaining one science because of the lab. Uh, there's no corruption. Right, so here's the cool bit. We do food production. Now remember earlier on I said that every yellow cube produces one blue cube. So this yellow cube here produces this one blue cube, and this yellow cube produces one blue cube. And you're probably confused at this point because you're thinking, well, hang on a minute, this guy's in, using irrigation. Surely he produces two food. Well, he has, because this blue cube on this card represents two food. So actually now we have four food, but only using up three blue cubes, which is gonna help with corruption. If you can imagine as the game goes on, later on when you're producing, you know, 15 resources, you don't use 15 blue cubes to do that. The blue cube on this card represents this number of food. So there we go. We also have um, food consumption, which is still one. So there we go, we're eating the food. And then we do resource production. So we gain three resources. And now we draw military cards. So we get two military cards over there, and that is the end of Green's turn. So we'll take the actions back. And then there, then there, that card was discarded. And now we go into Red's turn. So that's probably enough for part one of the video. We've gone through a lot of the rules so far. There's still plenty to come. We haven't seen the aggressions yet or wars or anything like that, but we've had a good introduction and we've covered a number of the mechanics. I hope it's been helpful if you're starting to learn how to play the game. I'll get this video edited as soon as I can and I'll get the rest of the video hopefully done tomorrow because I want to get it out there as soon as possible. So yeah, that's all for now. If you've got any questions, feel free to drop me a message either through YouTube or email or Twitter or however you want to get hold of me. Um, that's all for now. Take care and thanks for watching.